there, ready to roll. Tom, Hi, you Martin. got me right. Oh, fantastic. Fantastic. I'm sorry, mate. That's okay. No worries. Three man I was a little Good bit name. confused as the first time I used to use it. You know what? I actually, something came out wrong there. I wrote Tom Fremantle, and for some reason, it came Tom Fremanto. I can so see I'm Fremanto. Fix that. Yeah. It's, it, it it's a great cool name. I, yeah, I can roll. I can roll with that. It's okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, ladies and gentlemen, I'm Marcelo Palermo Van Schalke here with the one and only, the quintessential globetrotter, Mr. Tom Fremantle. How are you doing, Tom, today? I'm very well, thanks, Marcelo. Yeah, here from Taipei with an incredible time difference. I think it's 14 hours, isn't it? I think pretty much. <laughs> Yeah. Here it's like nine, ten or something like that. But you are there, what? It's 11, it's 11 o'clock right? in the morning. Yeah. 11 <clears> o'clock <throat> in the morning. But you woke up like what? What time do you usually wake up to? It really depends. So when I'm when I'm sort of on the road, I tend to wake up very early, you know, as the sun breaks. So sort of six o'clock, six thirty. Taipei, I'm tending to to teach quite late and it's sort of a later city. So I get up a little bit later, but still I, I tend to be an early bird rather than a night bed, <laughs> yeah, a night owl, yeah. Do you go to bed early as well, or you go to bed it, a little bit later? It, it totally depends. I have, you know, I have the two different characters, a bit like Tom Fremanto and Tom Fremanto. <laughs> the I mean, We're going to get the Tom Fremanto for the guy who walks. I, you know, <laughs> that would work well, Tom Fremanto. I've been called a lot worse, I have to say. So, you know, wonderful, I'm <laughs> I love it. I don't know how it came that way, but it seems that the computer works tricks on me. It's so a... we're like, well, maybe a good one for the walker. It's, it's a great name for a walker, a world walker. So <laughs> exactly. Three man toe, it's almost perfect. Man yeah. toe, <laughs> exactly. Part of the feet, right? Part of the anatomy of fit structure. So, you know, uh, by the way, I, w I was telling people, let me see if I did my homework. Right, you were born in Buckinghamshire, England, the United Kingdom. Is that right? That is correct. Yeah, absolutely. I yeah, did many my work many right moons there. ago now. Many moons ago. Many moons. Yeah. More than yeah. 21 years ago, right? Yeah, around 22. <laughs> Not when dinosaurs <laughs> roamed the earth. Yeah. Is it? <laughs> well, mate, I know that we're both in our 50s, you know, so, I mean, that's okay. We that's don't okay. look too bad. <laughs> yeah. we're, ha we're hanging in there. We're hanging, We're hanging in, in by exactly. our toes. Yeah. Absolutely. Our toes. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, Tom, you're a writer, you're a journalist, and you wrote so many books. I mean, I got to read one. I now have your platform and your structure, so I'm looking forward to download and buy more of your books. And it could be said that you're a quintessential uh, world walker. I said globe trotter because you've been all over. Now, let's go to the beginnings because this is all about you, mate. I want people to know who you are. You have an amazing story. How did it all start? Let's start from the beginning of Buckinghamshire, the <laughs> little Tom Fremantle. Let's start well, from the kickoff. <laughs> well, Buckinghamshire, I mean, Buckinghamshire, um, I lived in a tiny village. I was born in a tiny village called Swanbourne uh, with only about 400 people living there. A very beautiful place. I had a, a fantastic childhood. I mean, it was back in the day when kids could just go running around in the fields and come back sort of at night kind of thing. So it was a, it was a, I had a, a very happy childhood and, but I didn't really travel in, in, you know, I, I went on holidays with my parents up to Scotland with my parents and my sister. I didn't really travel abroad until I was in my late teens and early twenties. Um, but I remember very vividly, there was a, a very interesting character in Swanbourne. He was the, the school, he worked at the school and he was a school gardener. His name was Johnny Ginger. And he never traveled outside of Swanbourne. The furthest he went was the local town of Winslow, which was about two, two miles away. And he always bicycled everywhere. He didn't like cars. And um, he was a, a very sort of popular character in the village. And I remember I was quite a precocious child and I was always saying, I want to go here, I want to go there. And, <laughs> and one, one day I'm going to bicycle um, to Australia. And he was funny because he'd never, you know, he'd never been out of Swanbourne, but he'd cycled around Swanbourne so many times. And he said, well, I've already <laughs> I've already cycled the equivalent of Australia. And he also what, what was intriguing about him is he, he he didn't think the grass was greener anywhere else. He was very happy within Swanbourne and he compared it to the world. He sort of said, you know, the village stream is my Mississippi and, you know, the sand pit and the, 
the hills by Hogston and my Himalaya. So he, that's he was, very poetic. <laughs> very poetic. He was so he was a very very content within his world. And so my first book, I actually I, I worked in local journalism for about four years, and then I worked in Hong Kong um, many many years ago, back when it, before when it was still a British colony, back in 1992 to 1995. Okay. And then I wrote. Yeah, my, he actually my, was transferred in '97, right? It was transferred in '97, exactly. Yeah. Oh, so I, I, I just left before then, and I, I did a long bicycle ride from England to Australia, and I actually named my first book Johnny Ginger's Last Ride because I remember distinctly yeah, yeah, this yeah. conversation with Johnny from the village and how different. That was Johnny was. Ginger. The Johnny Ginger, right? That was the Johnny Ginger. <laughs> so, so yeah. Even though he said he'd cycled to, you know, the equivalent of Australia, going around the village. So, and I, I cycled from Swan, and I cycled from Swanbourne, the village I was born in, to Swanbourne in Australia. Swanbourne so it was Australia, twelve thousand yeah. miles, and it was an amazing journey. I mean, you know, really, I was never great at school, and I found that travel um, and talking to people on the road just completely sparked my imagination and opened up a whole new world to me so i felt very fortunate to do the trip and and to write about it too yeah so that's you where know, it, uh, it it reminds me of something back in shepherd bush in east london but talking about 1978 or like that something like that i had this short teacher whose name was patricia sue that was her name and i was always making fun of her because we were raised on the books of uh uh, Alexander Longman, do you remember Sandy and Sue? I don't know if yeah. you remember those guys. I, I do, I <laughs> you do. Yeah. You know, I'm Billy the Tiger. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You know, yeah. and I remember you used to, I mean, mock her all the time. Like, she looks like bloody Sue. She's like so sure she might be like that cartoon character, you know. And yeah. I mean, a couple of things she heard me, you know, and, and, and my my pals, my mates of class, you know, they all played along. And I remember she was saying this to do this many copies that you have to copy 500 times right this lesson or whatever she was through our weekends you know our benny hill nights you know things like that <laughs> or harold painter another one that we used to sneak up on her although when we were kids you know they tried not to let us watch a harold painter he was a little bit more for adults well benny hill he has two places you know the part that it was i believe that the show was all the way in between nine to ten for the family and from 10 to 11 p.m it will be the adult version yeah, yeah. i actually got to see a couple of sneaking through you know breasts yeah. for the yeah. first time one try to <laughs> harold Benny Hill. yeah oh, Benny, oh, Hill. Har Benny, yes. Benny Hill and Har harold pinter you get two, two very different cultural absolutely <laughs> absolutely absolutely but they were from for me for my formation formation of years you know they were as 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 inspirational and yeah. as present as some Spanish comedians such as uh, sure, Jesperito sure. from from uh, Mexico. I mean, those guys were all the mix. So we got in the south of the country. We got all of that, you know. So I remember this teacher basically uh, being very feisty and being, uh, you know, she was uh, uh, kind of like uh, uh, this person that she used to say to us. You know, are you daydreaming? Every time we were looking at her, she was boring with her lessons. You know, yeah. and I remember that when she will actually dictate numbers, I would write, you know, feet and, and arms in the numbers. And uh, she used to come over and say, are you daydreaming again? And she used to call us astronauts and margins and things like that. And <laughs> for everybody else to laugh. But I then afterwards came to realize that, yeah, sometimes, and, and it happened to me back in school in old Buenos Aires as well. When I was there, I used to do the same. There was another teacher that was, her name was Anna, and it, it was kind of the same. And yeah, sometimes, you know, it was boring. And I used to die dream a lot. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> so I, I, I just, not, perhaps it's like we don't want to be good at school because school was somehow boring. When I got the chance to teach, I tried to change all that bloody structure of just, you know, play by the rules and not be more creative and get kids to, you know, have yeah. more of a nice and good participation. You know, I and, think, and I, I guess think you as a teacher, you know. Education has moved on a lot. I mean, you know, back in that day when we were, you know, we're both in our 50s, as you say, and I think yeah. it was often very much teaching by rote, by the book. And you did have, you know, the occasional really inspirational teacher. 
who would, yeah. you know, kick everything oh, out of the box and, and, and they could be wonderful. But then, yeah, you did have some, and some of the textbooks were so boring. I mean, I, I don't know about you, but I, <laughs> I, I, I struggled with science. I mean, I, I love science now, but I struggled at school. And the books, the science books were just dry as dust. They were so dull. <laughs> and recently, dust. about, about um, I should think about 10, 15 years ago, I read Bill Bryson, who's a wonderful writer. His book, A Short History of Nearly Everything, I think it's called. And it basically is writing all about the history of the world, the history of science and all the very quirky scientists. It's got wonderful vignettes of Darwin and Newton and all these people. But it just suddenly, even, you know, in that, I read that in my 30s or 40s, and it just completely opened up the world of science. I now understood um, what atoms were, how electricity is made, you know, just by reading this book that was so accessible. It's, it's incredible, you know, how, how that can change things. You know, I had a teacher, actually, a science teacher in John 23rd, there, Chapel Bush, East London, whose uh, name was uh, Clarissa, Clarissa Shields, Clarissa something, I don't remember her last name. I remember she looked like Princess Leia, and she also was very short, bright hair and everything, <laughs> but she was so good that yeah. I fell in love with science. I mean, actually one of my motivations to become an anthropologist, I went through the social branch, not the medical branch, but uh, was her classes. When yeah. I was a kid, I was absolutely mesmerized by her, her beauty, and of course, how nice she was. She was one of those interactive you know, uh, teachers that will actually engage in, and it will make you, an active participant as a student, mm. so you will lock the class. And that's why, me and my case, I love sciences. And history, history is my cafe. I mean, it's yeah, because of the kind of professors that I have, kind of teachers that I have, all through, you know, elementary and high school and eventually college when it's a little bit different, of course. Uh, but Tom, I mean, your formational years, what can you tell us about your formational years? You talk about this gentleman who was going around the small city mm, and pretty mm. much in his back. A small home, village, not a city. I mean, really, uh, really small village. village. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Very, very much countryside. Yeah, I mean, so they were formative. And I think yeah, then once I started traveling, I, mean, I did this, this bicycle ride to Australia. And then on the when back of When did you start traveling? I mean, traveling, that, the first well, tra small travel that you had ever in your life. When was that? Um, to Scotland with my parents and sisters. Scotland with your parents. And Scotland, Scotland is beautiful. And I love Scotland. It is. And I, the I Highlands. Love holidays. The Highlands were amazing. And the Highlands, every August, I mean, all the mountains turned purple because of the heather. Um, yes. and, and we used to go up at August time. And, you know, absolutely stunning. And I, 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 I really fell in love with Scotland and Wales. We used to go to Wales as well, but very That's much real, within, yeah. within the UK. Um, so I look back very fondly on, on those times. And I suppose, but I'm not sure they really perhaps sparked the travel bug. I think um, it was when I, I worked for a local newspaper for several years and then I got this job um, with, eventually with a newspaper in Hong Kong. And then I started to sort of travel around Asia a bit. And then I did this, you know, huge bicycle ride, 12,500 miles. Wow. And that you were was, in your 20s then, right? I was in my late 20s then. Late 20s, and then, right. and, then um, and then after that I did, so I, I sort of, I wrote my first book and then my second book was about walking with a, a mule from Mexico to New York. So this was basically often my books fuse history and travel. I like, and so I, I followed an ancestor of mine who'd written a diary during the American Civil War and retraced his footsteps. And he'd traveled by mule some of the time. So I, I took this poor old mule out of retirement. Um, uh, she was a 17 year old mule called Brownie and I was given her by a Texan rancher right down by the Mexican border. And yeah, and she hated me at first. This mule. I mean, we, 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 <laughs> that we was San, uh, San Diego, Tijuana, right? That no, no, it was California actually or... Brownsville. It was Brownsville, Brownsville. And, oh, a little town called Meta, where am I? Metamoros. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Matamoros. Yeah, you're Metamoros. Right. Matamoros. Yeah. So just there, mm. and there's a and there's a tr there's a beach there called Playa Baghdad. Um, Playa Baghdad. Which is, yes, you're which right. is where which is where my ancestor had landed and, and gone up from there. So that's the route I took, and. Yeah, and then actually it was great. With the mule, eventually we sort of bonded. I mean, you know, as I say, she kicked me a lot at the beginning and I tried to change her shoes and all this sort of thing. But, um, and one thing I was very proud of actually is she hated bridges at the beginning. Even the smallest bridge, she would get very, very jittery. And, and by the end, she had the confidence to go right across the George Washington Bridge 
with a police escort into New York. So she completely changed there. So I was, I was quite proud of that. But I, I hope she enjoyed it. It's hard to know with a mule, but I... I, I you did. did. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You it was did. a good trip. It was a good trip. <laughs> so that was your first long Kansai epic trip, right? No, no, the bicycle ride was the first trip. This was the bicycle guess, ride. I'm sorry. This was you the follow-up. Right, this was the follow-up. That was that was yeah, that was your first experience in in America. Let's put it that way. Yeah, yeah. That was the first experience in there. And then and then I did a trip uh through West Africa, um, following another explorer called Mungo Park, who'd been there in 1795. And I I read his journal, um, which I found fascinating because a lot of the explorers back at that time, you know, the late 1700s, the early 1800s, were all very sort of chest beating macho characters. And Mungo Park was was quite different in that he, you know, he admitted he was terrified of lions. He um, but he was incredibly tough. I mean, all the other explorers who turned up in that part of Africa had basically dropped dead from malaria within the first few months. And he survived for two and a half years wandering around that part of Africa. Um, some of the um, people there, you know, thought he was a god because he had sort of blue eyes and fair hairs. Others thought he was a yeah. devil, thought he was, you know, had the eye of the cat on it. <laughs> For the same so reason. He, <laughs> exactly. So he had some people trying to kill him, some people, you know, treating him very well. But he had an extraordinary experience. And his, his, his diary was also quite humble. And he tried to very much, rather than sort of, you know, be a, uh, somebody who was trying to conquest Africa. He was somebody who was very much trying to interact with it and trying to, you know, get to know the people and write about them. But very sadly, Mungo Park, so he, he came back to London and he was became quite, you know, he wrote his journal. He was, he was a doctor. He became pretty well known. And the fame rather went to his head. And he went back 10 years later to the Niger because he was trying to find the source of the Niger. And the Niger is a very unusual river in that most rivers flow towards the sea, but the Niger flows away from the sea, right in towards the sort of Sahara Desert up to Timbuktu, yeah. and then kind of belches out by in Port Harcourt in Nigeria. So, um, so he was trying to find this very the source of this very unusual river, which of course the local people had known for years, but um, Europeans hadn't. So he, but he went back again in the second journey very very different man he turned up with soldiers with geographers a big expedition most of them died of malaria again quite easily mm -hmm. park didn't but he was very much shoot first ask questions later his whole attitude had changed and he got basically ambushed when he was in nigeria and he, and he was killed sadly so he, it was a shame what happened to him but he was almost like the first celebrity explorer because it was this was you know 1795 this was quite a long time before some of the others and, but his first journal and his first book was very, very humble, very charming and very different, as I say, to the more kind of chest beating, you know, explorers. That's amazing. And actually, you know, it brings all the history of how our ancestors, humans, we all have the same ancestors, despite, you know, different ethnic backgrounds, uh, but mostly we can all be traced. When it comes down to anthropology, we would say coffee and humans can all be traced to uh, Ethiopia. <laughs> Absolutely, yeah. It's, that, it's, 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 it's it, yeah, back to Africa, yeah. And yeah. you know, uh, when I, for example, from my mother, from my mother's side, we have you know different backgrounds. One of them uh, is a British background, and, and it traces down to the Tudors. And I'm like, what does that mean? So, yeah, but the Tudors actually, you know, it, 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 we didn't know that they were in France and in. The British Islands as well. Yeah. So the story starts to span and span and span. And then we, we start finding things. I keep on finding. I find that fascinating. And the fact that we bring all that background, you know, we bring it to ourselves and we get inspired and we move forward. That is amazing, really. And for example, like the fact that two lads like you and me I mean, were able to meet in the Mexican American yeah. border place. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely, yeah. And here we are, like, uh, you know, international friends and talking and doing pretty much things that will hopefully inspire people to actually go to travel, to read a lot. I say people, it doesn't have to be million or nothing like that. You have to get into the internet and instead of watching all the TikToks and people, you know, doing funny things and jumping around, just learn about history, learn about the world, about different cultures. And whenever you have an opportunity to travel, seize it. Because yeah. as you will say in it, you just recently put it perfectly well, Tom. It's the best way to get yourself educated. You gain lots of cultural background when you actually go and interact with people. 
Only yeah. one on one. Even if you had to be injured. I mean, I think so. I, th I think it's not for everyone, though. I mean, I think, you know, in some ways we're all different. And certainly for you and me, yeah. I mean, that travel has been this this kind of passport, this, this mm -hmm. you know, opening to another world, is the knowledge. And I think you get, I mean, I've got friends of mine who, you know, they're not interested in travel and, they're, and they're, they're, they love what they do. They've stayed in one place. Oh, yeah. And I think, I think there's horses for courses. I mean, I, I, I think very much, absolutely, if somebody, I, I mean, I've given, I'm sure you've done it as well, but I've given a lot of talks at schools and things like that. And you and you will get, you know, some people that mustard keen to be a doctor or to be a lawyer or to do whatever. You know, oh, yeah. one of those. And then you get somebody at the back of the class thinks, oh, actually, do you know what? Yeah, that, that you know, walking with a mule or doing something completely different <laughs> might, might be an opinion. Maybe not walking with a mule, but just, yeah, just the, the idea of traveling. Or dogs, is which is the case where you yeah. adopted. How many dogs did you adopt? <laughs> yes, dogs do. Dogs do. Yeah, yeah. Various different creatures. Yeah. <laughs> no, but the thing you're right. I mean, and, and, and yes, it's not for everyone. Uh, but I say people, just to get, I, I have friends who are, engineers doctors lawyers or whatever it may pretty much know like friends in new york that, that never left the big apple i say this is a big apple you know but you're limited and although you're limited you see the whole world in here interact with people from different cultures yeah. get to the internet and look for different things and you're right not many people actually like just to go and travel some people tell me uh, you're absolutely off your mind mm -hmm. i mean what are you doing traveling for like 30 40 hours, you know, getting into a plane, then a train, then a bus, then a camel, riding a camel. It was funny because I was in Egypt in uh, the slums of Giza, and I had a friend of mine who was an informant, a reporter, you know, a combat correspondent like myself. And uh, we went to his family house, a very humble place, and we needed to go to a pharmacy to buy something for his kid. And we called an Uber, and my, believe it or not, we got a camel. And I had the proof, I had the picture and the video. So the Uber was a camel, and the camel had a phone hanging from here that would mark <laughs> the GPS and everything. Brilliant. That was amazing. I mean, like, this is, I mean, how how can these things happen to me? I mean, in a good way, of course. I'm yeah, yeah, it's true, happy, it's true. You see? So, Tom, you got like, what is it, 6,000, 7,000 miles? Uh, no, kilometers oh, on of your, the of the world. Of the world walk. Of the, of the war work, yeah. Yeah. Because you kept on war. traveling, you went all over. Yeah. Well, I recently, so, so I did those sort of three journeys back in my 20s and early 30s, and I wrote books about them. And then, and then um, I have a, a grown up daughter now, and I had a sort of hiatus from not traveling so much. And then recently, in my 50s, I've started again with this, this world war, which was through America, yeah. through Europe, and through a slice of the Middle East. And I, I covered about 6,300 miles, and then COVID struck. So there was a sort of COVID pothole. And it caught you in that, Taiwan, right? COVID well, no, I, I, right? It, it, no, I, it, well, it oh. caught me in, in the Middle East, but then I, I wow. moved to Taiwan. So I got a teaching job in Taiwan during COVID. So I've been here for the last two years, which has been great, actually. I love Taiwan. It's a great place to teach. I, I love the people here. It's a, you know, it's a fascinating place to be. So no complaints. Um, but I am looking at kickstarting the uh, World Walk again next year. Um, uh, so, yeah, that, so it was, it was a shame it sort of came to a halt, but I felt very lucky to cover the ground I did, and it was an amazing experience, and it's a very different experience, as, as you know, travelling in your 20s and 30s and then travelling again in your 50s, you know, you've got that. You've but got you that, are more seasoned, you know, I like travelling in my 50s, I just turned 50 on May the 3rd. Uh, oh, you're right much younger than me. Uh, not much younger. Look at me. <laughs> <laughs> I should have shaved, you know. <laughs> Just a little bit younger, you know. <laughs> yeah, it's a, it's a good kind They're of Hemingway. It's that. a good Hem Hemingway right. beard. It's kind of exactly. Gan I got Gandalf, the Hemingway Gandalf meets Claude. Hemingway. It's good. Yeah. <laughs> Gandalf meets. <laughs> <laughs> I've been to that. <laughs> exactly. I've just got Gandalf eyebrows. You got the, the, you get you got a, the you know, My eyebrows actually, you know, they, they look me like you know, light brown and everything, but the whole hair and yeah. and, and and the beard goes. I'm sorry, yeah. the head also people can see it go grey. What can I do? I'm certainly certainly I'm Marcelo the Grey. I can say no Gandalf or Marcelo. The Grey. <laughs> but Tom, I mean, what's uh, if if there's any place? I mean, which places haven't you been? at i mean like say any oh, given so, part of the continent oh, so that... many so many places i haven't been i mean i haven't been to either the north pole or the south pole um we, in america know, oh yeah like in general i've been i've been i've been to um 
I, I, the furthest south I've been is, is um, well, actually, um, Argentina and Chile down that way. New Zealand. My daughter lives in New Zealand, so I've been there. But I, you, I haven't been Do you been went to... to Chile and Argentina? That's amazing. Because that's, yeah. the, that's south of the south. Oh, that's boy. south. That's south. That's south. <laughs> but I haven't been, yeah, I haven't been to the north part of the south. Oh, yeah. But I haven't, I haven't, I haven't covered um, certain parts. I mean, a lot of Africa I haven't covered. I've covered just a small section of West Africa. I haven't done any of East or South uh, Africa. Um, there's a lot of Asia, I haven't, I've never been, uh, Russia, I haven't been to, um, and not likely to at the moment. Um, <laughs> well, now, and, and, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, you've just been out to you. Who knows? You've just been yeah. out to, yeah. Yeah. And, That's not and, your lightest, uh, trip actually. Not a bench, obviously. It was, uh, a, a, a trip off of, of, first of all, it was for your charities, uh, to help. Well, not my, not my charity. I mean, and then I've got walk, a, right? I've got a very good friend called David Fox Pitt, and he's um, <clears throat> heavily involved with a charity called Siobhan's Trust, and they're doing amazing work. I mean, basically, as soon as the war break out, David, who lives in Scotland, and a, <clears throat> a, a little posse from Siobhan's Trust went over to the border, the Ukraine-Poland um, border. And at that time, at the very beginning of the war, there were, there were floods of refugees coming over. So Medica. They were at, uh, Medica, exactly. Medica. Where you went. So, I, was, I so, crossed through there, yeah. So you were, you, I mean, you possibly might have crossed paths with them, but they, they basically were, were feeding thousands of people every day at the beginning. And they took out a sort of mobile pizza oven, but then they sort of expanded. So now they've got six pizza trucks that they ta oh. take out into war-torn areas and basically feed the local populations there, the communities. And I was with them for a week. I finished my walk in aid of them, which was about 800 miles from Vilnius in Lithuania to Lviv in um, Ukraine. And then I joined them for a week out on the fringes of Kyiv, the capital. And it's really, it was really beautiful, actually, because, you know, on their website, they basically just say that they, you know, they, they give out pizza and love. And I thought that sounded sort of a little bit underwhelming, pizza and love, you know. But actually, pizza and love, when, I read that. In your, yeah, I mean, it's a nice, website, but I just yeah. thought pizza and love, and what, what's that all about? <laughs> but when I went, when I went with them, I could see what happens because you've got these six pizza vans so they produce a lot of pizzas and they're getting they get donations from germany and italy for the pizzas all coming over thousands and thousands of pizzas and they go into these communities and you, you see that i mean one of the saddest things i found is you've got these kind of you know you've got blackened buildings and pockmarked masonry yeah. collapsing walls i mean Terrible. you've seen it and <clears throat> and just devastation in certain areas and the, the local population especially the elderly and the children um, have been traumatized. And I, I found it, especially with the kids, it's as if, you know, all that sort of childish enthusiasm has sort of been drained out of them. They're like little adults. But then when Siobhan's Trust turn up, they, they bring these pizza trucks. So you get these nice smells of cooking permeating. Then they crank up music. It can be, you know, rock and roll, Bob Marley. It can be Scottish right. Highland bagpipe music. It can be sea shanties, just uplifting music. And then you have um, footballs and rugby balls get thrown into the mix. And suddenly you see these sort of benighted communities um, rising up again. And it's so nice. So, so they're actually performing an amazing role by giving out food and drinks and ice creams and, and just showing that the support there, it's very special. And they're going out, they're working with the police. They work with local fixers who um, there was a, a wonderful lady called Nina, who's actually an ex-Miss Ukraine. And she's now- Yes, she's, I saw that, the picture you working she, with her together. She, the she, yeah, she's, I mean, she's not resting on her laurels or her beauty. She's basically out there. She's been out to the front line with A. So front line, she's yeah. cut, cut pizzas with us. And she's got her own foundation doing work. There was another chap called Pasha, who's a rugby coach and a, just a really good guy within the local community. And they've linked us up with, linked up Siobhan's Trust Volunteers with the police. And so they, they often get police escorts now. So it's really an amazing thing. It's kind of spread. And I mean, I was only there for a week, and, but there's been volunteers who've been there since March all the time working out there. And a lot of them are from Scotland. So they wear these kilts and sporans and all amazing. weather. <laughs> they're, they're well, some of them are very warm, actually, you know. Yeah. They wrap you around very warmly, so <laughs> <laughs> makes sense. <laughs> so it makes sense. So, so they're doing just incredible work. So it was a real privilege to spend time with them and, um, and to raise a little bit of money for them. So, you know, that was, that was great. And it's nice to see, I mean, you know, Ukraine, it's, 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 the thing is, 
at the moment, it's been great because there has been these two recent military successes. I mean, Ukraine has been pushing back in yeah, Khan pushing Eve back. And Kherson had these tactically brilliant sort of military successes. Yeah. But there's still so much work to do out there. There's, I mean, there's been mines have been put everywhere. There's still missiles coming over. There's going to be so much rebuilding. And a lot of the people, there, the people are resilient, but they have been traumatized. So um, there's so much work to do. And I think any, and we, and we can't let that support waver, I think. With, I mean, you've seen it, Marcella. You know that, you know, th this is, uh, because I think at the moment, it's like we, there was a, so much support at the beginning. And I know I was, I was with a Polish charity briefly near the border. And they said at the beginning of the war, they'd had like 100 volunteers. And now they're down to about a dozen, just because obviously people are busy. Life goes on and the war is, you know, been extended. Um, but it's, I think now more than ever, that support needs to be shown um, to, you know, to keep that support and that solidarity. So that the, and the Ukrainian people, they, you know, I, when I did the walk through Poland and through Lithuania and through Ukraine, the people there were saying, basically, don't forget us. You know, don't, they, this was the big message I took. Don't, don't forget us. You know, we're, um, and I think that's you know so important. Yeah, you're absolutely right. I mean, the interaction that I had, that was always one of the last things they were telling you before you leave. Do not forget us, and, and uh, keep us on your prayers, and uh, uh, call us if you have a chance. Let's keep in touch. I have a couple of heartbreaking stories. Some of them ended well. Some of them did not end that well. And, uh, of course, you saw all this solidarity, especially in Poland. I mean, kudos to the Polish people. <clears throat> Excuse me. I, I mean, it had so many impressively, amazingly great experiences when it comes down to the Polish support, to those uh, who are in distress. And the thing here is, you know, as, a, as an international analyst, I was dead first when I went there, because my mission was to work the zone all the way from the Middle East to Ukraine. It was an epic journey, and the idea was to see what's going on with the gas, the grains, uh, you know, um, yeah. and all the industries that now have to uh, be pretty much moved somehow from Ukraine to other parts of the world, straining other parts of the world because of the war. I mean, while trying to keep Ukraine busy and, and active in the, in the world trade. And the thing was that at a point, you just don't care anymore about politics. You don't want to see no president, no political message. The only thing I was really caring about was to interact with regular everyday people mm. that they were suffering right time. Like you say, seeing this building is bombed and, and, and dark and full of marks, you know, and the, the, the smell of burning flesh and, and people living in, in, in basements. We stayed in basements, actually. I got people out of basements. Some of them, they didn't want to. Mm. They lost all the families, and uh, mm. it, it, it was it was heartbreaking. And, and the only thing you get to uh, you get to a conclusion that is, because uh, if we humans are stupid, defective, you know, and uh, ill-conceived species, will actually get to get it sucked together, and, and and just know what really these things do to everyday people. And I will say, you can say, Mr. Putin or whatever, well, bring any name you want. It's just understand what this actually do to people. Because most people don't go to war. But when war gets to you, like it is the case with Ukrainian people, mm -hmm. I mean, you got to think about that, you know, with some of the things that I was actually recently watching was, you know, uh, the, it was a documentary about Winston Churchill when he, uh, call the nation, you know, to fight everywhere back in the early days of World War II when things were very uncertain. And even, you know, the, the not then yet Queen of England when she was a teenager, and m many people don't know this, she was a mechanic. I mean, yeah, she was yeah. out there doing everything, you know, all those epic things, you know, when you don't know because what's going to happen because you're not going to war, the war is going to you. Yeah, I yeah. didn't care about ideologies, ideas, but politics. I'm just thinking about the people having to deal with those situations. I don't know, Tommy, if you had the chance to go uh, to Auschwitz, uh, Birkenau. Uh, you know, it, it, I went. I went with my daughter several years ago. Actually, it's it's very very moving. It's very haunting, isn't it? It it, um, it is haunting. That's the war. Yeah, I mean, the yeah, the sound yeah. of uh, birds. You know, you got lots of ravens going around because mm. the buses that we got to bring 
refugees and wounded soldiers from Ukraine to Poland. We got them from, there were tour buses from auschwitz Birkenau, mm. And we were fascinated by the fact that they gave it to us. And they said, you know what? Go and do your best. Don't worry about anything. If anything happens, don't worry. We, of course, were scared <laughs> because anything that will happen was that you can actually get a bomb or anything, you know, dropped on top of you that, you know, it, it was so moving that we went back with refugees and we took a tour with a group of refugees, of, of Ukrainian wow. refugees yeah. over there. And, and I cannot explain it. It, it. I actually took like five tours during my stay over there because we were coming and going, coming and going all the way from Kiev to uh, Krakow. And then we'll put people in planes. You know, it's quite a trip, you know, even what you're driving. More for you than you were actually doing the whole thing walking. Uh, but it was extremely moving. Yeah, and at yeah. a point, you come to see, you know, think, okay, humans, we got to get to about a stage. We kind of keep on going the way we're going. Uh, that's at least it's, my conclusion. Well, it's a very surprising thing to have have a, a, a war in Europe in, you know, mm. 2022. For them, so, and which, by the uh, way, yeah. for them, you've seen the same war. For them, it's very haunting as well. Because yeah. the memories, especially in Eastern Europe, the memories of World War II are all there. Absolutely. I mean, they're very fresh. No matter and very, it's been 80 years. And very complicated. I mean, you know, the, the sort of relations between Poland and some of the Baltic states. And, yes. you know, it's all very complicated. But, of course, they're all united now against what's happening in, in Ukraine. I mean, Poland have been uh, terrific. I mean, they have a complicated history with, with Ukraine, too. And I think, yes, I mean, in indeed. Ukraine, it's, it's, a, it's a complicated one because I think... Um, you know, Ukraine itself, a lot of talk of, you know, Ukraine fighting for democracy. But I, I mean, Ukraine has had a shaky democracy at best. And it's it's more to do Very with shaky, isn't it? Ukraine fighting for its, you know, people fighting for their friends, their families, their country, their very soul. You know, that that's what the Ukraine is. And it has been remarkable. I think, you know, the fact Russia invaded, and I think um, President Zelensky staying put made a huge difference, and his family. You know that that gave oh, yeah. gal that galvanized people, um, and the, the resistance has been just incredible. I mean, you know, yeah. of course, there's been Western aid from the point of view of mil military aid, um, but it's been the Ukrainians who are fighting, um, and as long as they want to fight, I think we we have to support them. I mean, certainly, I feel that as somebody living in Europe, I feel they're fighting a war for kind of. All of us up to a point. Um, no, exactly. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Not true. And, and by the way, uh, you're right. I mean, Ukraine, all that part of Europe has a very complex and complicated history. You know, uh, they were part of the Soviet bloc back in the days. I mean, Nikita Khrushchev was born in, in Ukraine. I mean, and one of the reasons the back in 2014, Putin quote says uh, one of his motives to take Crimea back in 2014 was because he said, well, Nikita Khrushchev gave Crimea back in the day to Ukraine and uh, there was a deadline and now we are actually getting to, we're going to be sure that that deadline is meet and we're going to get it back. That's one of the things that he used to say back in 2014 because people mm -hmm. tend to, many people actually don't think the thing that the war just started. The war just started, I mean, seven yeah. months ago, but no. This whole thing started in 2014, and what about Georgia back in 2008? I well, yeah, exactly. Well, yeah, yeah, yeah. One of the soldiers, a combatant who was a kid back then in 2008, you know, he got shot three times by so about sorry, I'm sorry, by Russian soldiers back in 2008, and now he's, you know, a freedom fighter showing, you know, the Ukrainian mm -hmm. forces, and he's over there. He was one of our drivers. I remember yeah. him very well. We contact and everything. He's safe, thank God. But I mean, yeah, the world is a mess. We humans are a mess. We're upside down, but we have to make it better one way or another. And what we're doing, what we're at it, enjoy the ride. <laughs> yeah. Well, there's, we there is, to. I mean, you know, you, the, you have to spread it. I think that one of the things we should always trust is, yeah, despite all the, the horrors that are going on, I mean, these guys go out there in their kilts, they give out pizzas, and they're trying to spread joy. I mean, you, that's what you need to yes. do in a sense. It's, it's trying to just go to these communities, and, and there is some hope there. And, you know, um, you've just, uh, there has to be, otherwise it's all too bleak, isn't it? So, um, yeah, and so there's some, but it was, uh, yeah, I mean, I think from the point of view of, of what's going on, um, it has been very encouraging, these, this, these pushbacks from Ukraine. Um, and, it is. You know, let's hope they continue, yeah, yeah. And as you say, the support has to keep on going. I know they're doing the fight. Some of us going there as volunteers, doing some... Uh, 
you know, task force work and whatever is requested for especially civilians and wounded soldiers and civilians to be, you know, put in a safety place, in a safer place, you know, or taken away from the war zones and war zone zones. But uh, the, the, the health has to keep them. Well, I think anyone, anyone who's listening to us talking now, I think, you know, I know Siobhan's Trust, they're always looking for volunteers and it's an oh, amazing thing to do. Them. You know, it's, it's, I was only there with a week for them, but, you know, it was just extraordinary and, and really beautiful to witness, you know, some of the reactions going on. Um, and, and I think as winter comes as well, they're going to need, you know, volunteers more and more. But there's yeah. uh, obviously there's so many. I mean, I think it's, it's just not giving up on Ukraine. It's showing that the support's still there, whether it's, you know, wearing a Ukrainian flag or putting one up in your house or your car, whatever. And, or if there's a march in, in, you know, championing Ukraine, all that kind of thing. It, it all helps show that there's still the support there. Yeah, and, um, and that the war, the, the killing, you know, the violence has to stop. Yeah. To, now, the 21st century, 2022, like you said, I mean, and in Europe, despite eight years from World War II and, and many other conflicts, you know, but it's still so fresh in there. Yeah. And now this, really terrible. Tom, you just came back from Ukraine, from that epic trip as well. And well, you came back now here. I mean, we, should, we have you here for coffee. We have you in Taiwan and uh, you started teaching again, right? Actually, I have indeed. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's, Tell uh, us about your teaching activities over there, your experience over there. Well, I mean, Taiwan, I mean, there, you know, Taiwan has got this, uh, has been in the news a lot. Uh, yes, because it's also a, an area that it's, on the spot right now. There's, right, a, right there's, now, a, there's a bit of tension with China. I mean, the people here are, are yeah. very resilient too in that they've, they've had the sort of potential threat of uh, China for, you know, many, many years now, for decades. Yeah. So they tend to just get on with their lives. And, um, you know, Taiwan is actually a very prosperous little island. 23 million people live here. Yeah. It's, I think it's got the 23rd largest economy in the world. I mean, they've been very go ahead. And they've, you know, basically Taiwan is now a, a democracy. Um, yes. But it's uh, interestingly, it's only recognized officially by 15 countries worldwide, worldwide, because back in 19 in the 1970s, the early 1970s, basically Taiwan was recognized and then the West shifted all their recognition to China and then yeah. Taiwan got sidelined. Mm -hmm. Having said that, you know, Taiwan does, of course, have support from the West, from America, from the UK, from Europe, but it's not official. So there's this, strange, right. there's this strange status quo whereby, you know, when, for example, Taiwan go to the Olympics, they have to have the name Chinese Taipei Chinese to keep Taipei, China yeah. happy, um, which I, I mean, <laughs> and I, 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 th I feel terrible about it. But I have to say, since I've been here, I sort of understand why the majority of Taiwanese just want to keep the status quo because they understand, you know, the threat of China is on them. And they also don't want to be used as a pawn by the West. So it's a complex situation here. Um, but the pe but it's an amazing little place. Teaching here is a joy, I have to say, because um, all my students are the highly diverse groups of students, very, very keen to learn. They're trying to get Taiwan um, fully uh, fluent in English by 2030 is the aim. So there's a real hunger um, to speak English. And I've got, you know, I've got some students who are sort of five year old kids up to sort of very, very advanced students who are sort of doing PhDs. So I love that variety. Um, and so, so yeah, it's, it's, it's fun to do. And I'm, um, I've been here for yeah two years now teaching. So it's been, it's been a great experience and I feel very grateful to Taiwan. Um, uh, cause it was a good place to be during COVID. I came here actually initially, my do my grown up daughter lives in New Zealand and I came here partly to be nearer her, but that didn't work out well because Taiwan <laughs> having had a very good start, it had a year of sort of not having hardly any COVID at all, but then it sort of completely shut down and New Zealand did the same thing. So I've only yeah. recently just seen her again, but um, no, but it, generally it's been a, a great experience being here. Yeah. But you did see your daughter, you were able to do so. And uh, you have a very loving, particularly amazing relationship with her, right? She's your daughter and she's your friend. Well, I hope so. I mean, she's, <laughs> I'm sure I embarrassed. It I, looks I'm like, like, it like, looks any, like, like any, like any Which dad, is amazing. I, I, like any dad, I embarrass her horribly at times. Um, but she's uh, no, she's she's doing great. She's tra she's just finished her training as a midwife, so I'm very proud of her. Um, so we've got a bit of yeah. yeah. Um, so yeah, it's it's uh, so 
it's um, amazing. So, so basically, she's been in New Zealand now since she was 10, and it's a great place for her to grow up. Again, it's that place, only 4 million people live in New Zealand, very outdoorsy. Yes. Um, you know, the education system's very good there. So, you know, it's been, she loves it there. It's been, a, and it's home for her now. Yeah. How do you compare New Zealand with Australia? Some people actually find lots of things alike. I, I actually didn't that much. There are a couple of things, yeah? But not that much, though. I mean, in my very, it's not very different, thing. very different geographically. Yeah. I mean, I don't I know agree. Australia so well, but, you know, the outback, these huge expanses, New Zealand's much more lush. Um, oh, I, think yeah. the, I think the characters are slightly different as well. I think a, a New Zealanders are a bit more understated. The Australians mm -hmm. are kind of so. I, I, I think oh, there, yeah, are, right. there are par there are parallels. But what was quite funny is when my daughter moved to New Zealand, she um, she was she was ten, and within about three days, she was like, "Hi, Dad, it's great out here. It's good as gold." She got she completely got this amazing <laughs> sort of Kiwi accent, which she's kept. The Kiwi accent, yeah. I mean, so it's so it's so strong, and she sounds. When you're like, a kid, yeah. you catch it right away. You're exactly. Like when you, when you're right, a kid, you just everything. adjust. <laughs> But my yeah. ex, my ex, who, who sounds very, very English, and it's all very harmonious, we get on fine. And she's a great <laughs> mum, I have to say. Um, but she's got, and she sounds completely English still. So as an yeah. adult, she went there and she kept, retained her British accent. But my daughter now is like, yeah, pretty much pure <laughs> Kiwi. Yeah, it's quite funny. How so about your people? accent, Marcello? Because you were born, you, you were born, you know, born in Argentina and you've you been in yeah. El Paso. You, your accent is a great fusion of. <laughs> Oh yeah, it's a mix. But you know, it's like again when you when you get it when you are a kid, you know, it's like you're like a sponge. You absorb it right away. So it's it, it, it's hard to get rid of it. Sometimes if I invited to prone to speak in English, you know, especially southern programs, I try to use a more calm and neutral accent. But, you, you, <laughs> but I feel more comfortable speaking this way because that, but, that's the way I've been raised. <laughs> but when you were but in the UK, you lived in like Liverpool, didn't you? You, you, you were. Uh, no, no, actually, it was uh, Shepherd Bush. It's, it's long oh, you were East London, far. sorry. I don't know what yeah. you okay, Shepherd Bush, yeah. I went to John 23rd. So it, it's a okay. funny thing because uh, I went to John 30, 23rd in Argentina in the same school, same, a, a different branch, but over there it's in Eastern London, Shepherd Bush, uh, which is actually the part where the Sex Pistols were oh, yeah. raised as yeah. kids. So when I was a kid, to me, I saw those kids, you know, spiky hairs, you know, and all the fashion and everything that, I mean, John Lydon was right. Eventually they made it a fashionable thing and broke the spirit of the whole thing. But I mean, when I was a kid, to me, seeing a kid like that walking around the streets, well, like seeing Spider-Man or Superman or Batman, uh, you know, yeah. it was like, it was I, I fell in love time. with the whole thing. To me, yeah. they were like the folks heroes, you know, the heroes, the people heroes. They're not like, you know, and you can talk to them and everything. So when I grew up, uh, when I was around 16 years old, you know, I was very spiked, spiky hair as well. I had like yeah. my Don King kind of yeah. <laughs> hair. I, I, and I think if you I, were a teenager then, it, it really was a key moment. The sort of punk oh, movement yeah, absolutely. Was, was what it, it blew everything apart, didn't it? For a bit. But it was very short. Know, it was very short, but it was, yeah. No, it was, but you know what? Punk, yeah. punk, rock had a, punk rock had a comeback in 1987. And in Buenos Aires, we had a guy whose name was Luca Proden. Luca Proden was an Italian uh, Scotland man who went to school in Wales. And one of his mates was Prince Charles. Oh, yeah. Luca Proden died. Yeah, and, and it's true. I mean, he had the pictures and everything. He, he died in 1987. He formed a band uh, whose name is Sumo. Okay, and it was a punk okay. reggae, ska, reggae ska band. Okay. Ska was great. Oh, yeah. Well, yeah. I'm going to send you actually some of the music. Uh, one sure. of the songs is about the McDowell's and McDonald's uh, clan. Oh, McDonald's and old, Campbell. Yeah, the yeah. McDonald's and Campbell and the McDowell's. Uh, it was like a war story from like the mm -hmm. 1100s in Scotland. And the song's name is uh, Basil Gray, Crua Can. You know, okay. so okay. I gotta, I gotta send it to you because when you, <laughs> it, it's amazing. It's though, I don't know about you, but if you, have you seen any of these bands? So I mean, a lot of these bands are still touring. You know, they were they were punk bands. Oh yeah. I, I went with. It was very funny. I went. I mean, in my fifties, I went with another mate of mine called Matt, and we went to see a band called Stiff Little Fingers, who were kind of a big band back in the seventies, eighties. Yeah. And, I mean, one and, of those and, and it was actually so funny because we turned up and we were looking a little bit conservative, sort of in t-shirts and jeans. A lot of the people there were wearing the same t-shirts back in 1981, still had the same so haircut. Yeah, so, it it really you know? was. But, they, but I have to say, they, 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 I, I thought 
you know, perhaps the gig won't be that special. They still had it. You know, they, they, they still really got the, <laughs> they you know, got the crowd going. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, two of my favorite ones are, you're going to remember this ones, uh, the Lurkers and the UK Subs. Oh, UK Lurkers Subs, and UK crazy. Subs. That's I mean, a name from the past. I, yeah, I, yeah, I, yeah. I used, they used to come to Buenos Aires like twice a year back in the 90s. Really? And I, I would go and see them, of course, as I went to see the Sex Pistols and I went bananas. And uh, Where did I remember you them. Where did you see the Sex Pistols? But, 1996, when they uh, oh, when they oh my reunion goodness. tour, yeah, okay. where yeah. Glenn Matt looked back at base. Of course, wow. his species was long gone. Yeah, uh, he yeah, died in yeah. February 1979, but that was an amazing thing. And I used to go to see uh, Steve Jones with the neurotic uh, outsiders. He used to go down there to Buenos Aires like, in the 90s. He was like, twice a year, those guys will always be there. And yeah, I have yeah. an anecdote with the uh, band Oasis, with the Gallagher brothers, actually. Back in 1997, they came to tour to Buenos Aires and they decided to stay for a month. Wow. And they used to go to a bar, they used to write for a newspaper, an old newspaper. And we used to come down from the old building and there was an old Irish pub around there. And they really used to go there to get hammered all the time. <laughs> and I used to go there, we used to drink, and uh, eventually we got together, we drank a lot. And Noah once, Noah Gallagher, the younger brother, was so hammered that uh, I started talking with his bro and everything. He said, we need to put this blow back in the hotel. I mean, he's, he's not going to make it. I mean, what can we do? So we actually helped him out to his room. Yeah. <laughs> but did they not fight? They're notorious, those two, for fighting amongst themselves, aren't they? Did, oh, they yeah. ever, did you no, ever have to you, separate them up? <laughs> you know that at that point, I thought it was more of a commercial thing. You know why? Because it might be because they were hammered, mind you, but they were doing fantastic and getting along then, you know. And the concerts there were off a chance, amazing. I mean, yeah, a lovely, yeah. great band, of course. Manchester finest, I would say, when it comes down to pure and heavily, and heavily you know. Beatles influence. Beatles, they love. Oh the yes, Beatles. absolutely. But you know what? Oh, well, you're gonna be surprised. You're gonna be surprised, mate, because I talked to them, and I actually said because my father was a Beatles fan. I mean, my uncle Norbert. I mean, it's an Italian folk who looks like a mad, angry, Irish, you know, guy. So he went to London. He doesn't speak a lot of English, but he has this, you know, crazy, drunken, mad old guy face. <laughs> he said, well, some people won't talk to me. I'm like, you know why? Because they probably thought that you were a mad, drunken Irish man over there, and they would probably throw a punch or something. <laughs> <laughs> But they were, I, I was actually asking them, you know, I said, okay, guys, you obviously have an influence by the Beatles. I said, no, you're wrong. Uh, one of our biggest influences were the Sex Pistols. I said, are you kidding oh, okay. me? And okay. they said, they told me, actually, uh, Liam told me, no, no one told me, if there was a band that I would like to tour with, uh, go out and tour with, it would be the Sex Pistols. Oh, really? It was, it was, I got surprised. He told me what? that. I mean, place of fact. I have to. Yeah. I have to say, I was interested in Me Mexican Mexicans, um, and I found on the border there was quite an interesting music scene. There's a chap, oh, Tom, yeah. Rus Tom yeah. Russell, who, who tours actually regularly, and he comes to the UK a lot. Um, so, the, very interesting music. Oh, scene Russell, yeah. I found people love um, the, the Mexicans love the Beatles. I mean, so there's one radio station. Everybody does. Hour. <laughs> well, everybody. Yeah, I mean, the Beatles are the Beatles, but yeah. but. It was fascinating in Mexico because they literally have one radio station where they play an hour of Beatles music. Well, it might be Beatles music or it might be a single by John Lennon or Paul McCartney yeah. for an hour every day. But I was very lucky. I went to see Paul McCartney. He did a free gig in the middle of uh, Mexico City and it was absolutely amazing in the Zocalo. And uh, so I, 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 I love the Beatles, of course. But so I went there. I have to say it was very moving because it was it was Paul McCartney, for heaven's sake. So, you know, there he is. And the crowd, just the love going out was just oh, massive. Yeah. Oh, it yeah. was beautiful. And, and McCartney's incredible, actually, because he played, I mean, he played for about two and a half hours. These old rockers, I, I like seeing people like Springsteen and Dylan. They have this massive back catalogue, so they can play for hours and hours, and they love it. They, but it, they, they have it, some stamina. I mean, the Rolling Stones, might. Oh, I mean, amazing. Of course, I, I yeah, saw yeah. them live in 95, and then here in El Paso, they came to the Sambo Stadium, uh, South Texas, 2010. I yeah. mean, Charlie was was still very, very, yeah. very active. You know, unfortunately, yeah. he got rest of soul. I mean, he, he passed away. But they're touring again. I know. I mean, I mean there's, see, no, there's no stopping these reaches. guys. I, I think they just yeah. keep on rocking, don't they? But with, which with, I with think just, is amazing. Me dad used to watch them and see them. And, oh, yeah, I, mean, I, I love that. I'm, I'm, I'm fascinated. Absolutely. You know.
J just very quickly <laughs> going back to the the, the former county gig it was funny because sure. he played so he went he 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 could play all the instruments so he played there's like a an instrumental black uh version of blackbird very beautiful song just just by oh himself. yeah and that, then and then you'd have like live and let die with fireworks going off and then you'd have sort of, of you know these old beatles classic some love songs some rock and roll some weird Yesterday, all great yeah, but and and then the final but the final hey, song the, the, was hey jude the, i think he always does this they play hey jude but what he was incredible to, yeah, he always plays that what was incredible is he played hey jude and you know at the end he goes na 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 so in the zoccolo in mexico city they basically had this crowd just going na 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 and, the, and then paul mccartney basically left he left he got he went home and the crowd was still na and, and for literally still. about 20 minutes afterwards still and people were you know filtering off the streets still all na -na, for ages and ages so it was it was an incredible atmosphere when i go to see him actually that's exactly what happened to him in the river plate stadium and then i where else I I saw him at Donington, and then here, what was it, in LA? But I mean, when he leaves afterwards, everybody, he goes, let me hear you scream or something yeah. like that. You go, Judy, 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 yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, well, by the way, how, how good are you with karaoke? I, I I love it, but I'm terrible. I mean, I sound like a kind of harpooned walrus when I sing. I've got, really? I, I, but 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 I like singing. I, I like <laughs> my my daughter. My daughter's got a lovely voice. I she hasn't inherited it, that from me. You, you know, gotta so. bring her here. It's a big thing here, you know. Yeah. I have a friend actually has a house that he turns it into a pub, a big pub, and they bring this wonderful karaoke machine. And sometimes even bring my guitar. And uh, we sing all night long some Mexican songs, and yeah. then uh, all that men come rasping me, and I sing rock and roll. So you know we all have fun. Fantastic. When people well, sing ballads, you clap your hands and you wait for the other one to sing something more cheery. <laughs> well, I, when, when I when I when I next come over to El Paso, I, I'd love to join you. But I warn you, you'll be you'll be showing me the door pretty quickly with my voice. No, it's, no, no. It's I, not a thing I, of beauty. I can hit the deep no. notes. I got, I've got a, I've got a good blues you've singer's got, voice. But you've I got know. Yeah. Deep voice. <laughs> That's good though. I mean, yeah. you know, it's always lots of fun. By the way, I mean, yeah. if I uh, please uh, help me out, contact this guys from this foundation. If I'm going there, I'm not sure, but we were trying to see if we could actually go back. We were asked to go back by late February, early March okay. to Ukraine, and yeah. uh, I'm good at baking pizza, so I, I might I might help them out. Okay. Earlier, you know? well, they, they, I mean, the amount of time, they, they bake so many every day. There's a, yeah, and I think there's I think well, great. Let me know if you go. Out. I do the I, dough and everything. I go from the get go okay. from scratch all the way to the sauce. I do the whole thing, you know. That, that that's wow. that's Italian running through me. Uh -huh. Yeah, well, that's yeah, because you're, 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 you're a complicated mix, aren't you? Cultural. Oh, mix. yes. You've got all sorts I'm, of a, there, I'm, a, I'm a fruit salad, which yeah. I love actually, <laughs> because people don't know, but we mostly all are. So, you know, yeah, <laughs> we just don't yeah. know it, but we yeah, all are. Yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> that, yeah, down the line for sure. Yeah. <laughs> so, we are going to do this again, uh, but for the ending credits, <laughs> you yeah. have the last word. Go ahead. Well, it, it's been it's been great to catch up. So, I, I mean, Marcelo, I met you all those years ago when I was walking yeah. Pancho, my street dog, along. Pancho, the, the, that's right. Pan, and uh, I, so, basically, I walked from Juarez, where I lived, from to Juarez, yeah. um, uh, to El, to uh, Tijuana, and to we Tijuana. both know Pastor Galvan, who has this incredible Pastor Galvan, yeah, in the Who's middle of the have desert. Who's going to have an event on Sunday? I will see him on Sunday. Oh, actually, actually. Oh, do say hello from me. I mean, I, I will. Him. He's I will. completely bonkers, but he's absolutely wonderful. He's oh yeah. <laughs> Um, and wrong. actually, I have Absolutely. to say, just on that score with Pastor Galvan, so he has basically a group of people out in the desert. They are homeless people. They are drug addicted. He takes in people who haven't basically got anyone else. And he, he has this place that basically is a little family right in the middle yes. of the Chihuahua Desert. It's a very special place. And I actually did my, my, so just very quickly with, with you know, my first walk of the world walk i went to see pastor galvan because i um uh i went to see the, the dog charity that i'd got pancho from yeah. and i went to see and i and he every morning he walks with all the people some in wheelchairs yes. for, for a mile into the desert and a, a mile back and it's one of the most moving walks you'll see it's just it's a beautiful thing and i think you know we've been talking about traveling and walking and for me my big message is is walking is so special it's something 
yes. you know, that we take for granted. Um, but it's it's something, um, you know, it's been very good to me. I've walked thousands and thousands of miles um, in my life. And, 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 it, and a lot of it kicked off again in where you are, El Paso and Juarez, uh, through through this, this amazing and very crazy pastor. <laughs> <laughs> no, I was of, saying. Uh, I was saying before. Sorry, sorry. To, I didn't mean to interrupt. That his uh, group is called uh, Pelos Duros, which Pelos means Duros. Hard, hardened, hard, hard hair, hard hair, or like hard greasy hair. Yeah. Because he calls that the people that he finds in the street. I mean, they probably many of them didn't take a shower for weeks or months. So they say the first thing they notice is that they have a greasy hard hair. So yeah. that's what Pelos Duros means. <laughs> well, he, and he takes in the people that nobody else in Juarez wanted, and it, yes. he does he does amazing work. So yeah, it's a, the ones um, who are absolutely being left aside of everything. Yeah, society, and, and in a sense, right. I think I think we met partly through him because I think it was an introduction, and I through I, uh, uh, through Mariano, and eventually we got to know that Pastor Galvan was in because he comes a lot uh, yeah, to the radio right. station. He, spoken to and him. we got yeah. you to the radio station. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah. <laughs> Which was so, th so thank you. So it's amazing this connection, reestablish this connection and that's great. And keep that's up the keep up the great work on the border. You do you do great work, Marcelo. Thank you, Red. Um, you keep on being legendary, my friend. As uh, you are. Very, 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 minor legend <laughs> no no you're a great legend and uh, we have to make that be known all over the bloody world they have to know you you do a great job you're an amazing character an amazing person and you are the quintessential glove trotter well there's there's many of us many people out there do much more than me but yeah including yourself but thank you um so you are yeah, the one. Let, I'm let's let's <laughs> let, let's let's stay in touch and um absolutely keep each other posted. okay great to chat mate we will do this again. Tom Fremantle, the quintessential globe trotter. Thanks a lot, mate. You have a great day there, Taipei, uh, Taiwan. I'm sorry. Yeah. And uh, yeah. we're going to start in. <laughs> and I should be saying good night to you. Yeah. Buenas noches. Good night. Yes. <laughs> and sorry about, yeah, I'm sorry about the Tom Fremantle. Fremanto, yes. But you Tom can use Freeman that. You can I use might that. use that. It's a good one. Tom Fremanto. <laughs> kind of catchy. My amazing. alter ego. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Cheers, mate. Thanks, Tom. Thanks, great thanks everybody, for watching. For Epic yeah, News, this is Marcelo yeah. Palermo Vanche and Ken Tom Fremantle. You have a great night, great day. Cheers, mate. Bye for now. Bye.